So we have time for questions. If you, uh, if you have a question, you might, uh, there are uh, microphones going around the room. Uh, give your name and then ask your question if you would. Go ahead. We we'll get this one in the front to start off. Mirzal, that was a lovely talk. You, you've got this integration point, RAB8. Do you want to just say a little bit more about what you think is going on there? Because you've got both of those uh, kinases integrating onto that one component. So, um, RAB8 turns out, so it turns out that pink one regulates a subset of RABs and LERT2 regulates a subset of RABs. And RAB8 turns out to be one of the RABs that it's in common with both. The region of, of the, the pink one side is on the C terminus, and the region on the pink on the lower two sides is on the, the switch to domain. And so it turns out the switch to domain is the sort of business end of the RAB. But we actually have now uh, some, some new evidence, at least in, 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 in vitro, that the phosphorylation of, of the pink one site on the RAB8 can, can actually influence the ability of LARC to, to, to phosphorylate uh, its site. And we've actually benefited actually from a former Crick medalist Jason Chin, so we've used his technology to engineer a phosphorylated form of the RAB8 at C111 and shown that LERC2 is now no longer able to efficiently phosphorylate its site. So we don't as yet know much about the biology in terms of the cell biological function of RAB8, but certainly conceptually we think that there is some suggestion that there is an interplay there at the, at the biochemical level. So you, you, you said that these cells that produce the dopamine, they don't renew. I mean, aren't there any stem cells around that uh, might be stimulated to renew in some way? I mean, there are stem cells that have been found in the brain, for example, in the subventricular zone. Um, I, it's not, I, I don't know, to my knowledge, if anyone has tried to coax those cells right. into dopamine lineages. Certainly, the main work that's been done has been to... Um, try our, our transplantation of, right, of right. differentiated dopamine cells operatively into, into the place. brain, into yeah. those regions which are and, it, and, and the location turns out to be very important in that, does it? So, so it turns out, actually, people have looked at when you, when you transplant dopamine neurons, you might think that it's important to put it into the nigra where the dopamine neurons actually naturally reside. That's a very small area. The dopamine neurons arborize and innervate thousands of neurons in the striatum, a slightly more larger, more tractable area. And it turns out, from my understanding, it actually makes very little difference whether the dopamine neurons go into the striatum or the nigra. So generally, surgeons prefer to just go into the striatum. Right, right. Yeah. Yes, this one. It's OK, I got it. Hi, thank you for um, a great lecture. I really enjoyed it. You mentioned that at least 20 genes were implicated in Parkinson's. You've mentioned alpha synuclein, LERC2, and PINK1. How can you hope by targeting one specific gene when there are at least 20 that may be involved that you can develop a treatment that would have a clinical impact on a disease that is so multifactorial? So that's a, that's a very good question, and I think we can learn a lot from what's already done in the cancer field, where mutations have been identified in oncogenes in rare families that have heritable forms of cancer. And it turns out that the drugs that have been developed to target those genetic forms turn out to have utility in other patients who do not have the mutation per se, but who may have, for example, downregulation of the pathway. So it may be that in sporadic patients, whilst they don't have a mutation in synuclein or in LARC or pink, it may be that the signaling pathways, which are controlled by those proteins, are somehow underactive, or under, and, and that is then allows them to be able to be uh, uh, benefit from the medication. I mean, ultimately, what we would like is to use the technologies of, of pink and parkin to be able to interrogate sporadic patients <coughs> to be able to stratify those sporadic patients who have downregulation of the pink parking pathway and be able to see, well, those patients would benefit from drugs activating that pathway. So a question at the back and another one at the front here. Professor uh, Hugh Ward. Um, 
Have you noted any connection between the emotional state of the patient and the progress of the disorder? So, indeed, Parkinson's affects not just the motor system, but, can all, but also affects the serotonergic system that affects how you, our mood system. And certainly, uh, in, in Parkinson's, being depressed or having depression can have a secondary negative impact on the motor function. And so it's often the, part, the depression is hidden. It's not clear either to the patient or even the clinician. It takes a bit longer to, to, to determine. But if you then treated that patient with an antidepressant, you would see not only an improvement in how they feel, but also in their motor symptoms, something actually now that, that, that we're now much more vigilant about. It's something actually that's seen in many not just Parkinson's, but other neurological diseases, is that there's a very strong interplay between how you feel and emotional stress and the neurological, physical manifestations. Yeah. Um, thank you for a brilliant talk. My name is Esther Samler. So obviously for clinicians, I'm really, really interested in treating patients. And you gave this brilliant example of this one patient with a Parkin mutation where there is clear evidence that the pink Parkin pathway is perturbed. So how would your ideal personalized treatment or compound look like for a patient like this? So I think for a patient in which we, which cannot be, so this patient, for example, cannot be phosphorylated by pink, we would want to develop a, a, a drug that could somehow bypass that regulation and activate the enzyme by a different method, by maybe an allosteric method. And we are very interested now in trying to develop better biomarkers in patients to be able to kind of define at the molecular level what the defect is and then tailor them. But certainly there is a lot of emerging work on Parkin activators that would be of benefit in such patients. There was a question right at the back. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Hi, John Todd from Oxford. Um, in your 20 gene slide, there was one gene and protein conspicuous by its absence, and that was MAPT encoding tau. Do you think that um, protein is in acting in your pathway? So it turns out that um, so the genes that I uh, have talked about today are the genes that are causative of monogenic forms of Parkinson's. It, much work has been done to look at variants through genome-wide association studies where much more subtler genetic variation is linked to the disease. And it turns out from those studies that variation in this, in this microtubule associated protein tau is a strong susceptibility factor for Parkinson's. We have not yet experimentally tested uh, biochemically an interplay between tau and the pink Parkin pathway. We now have the ability to do that if we were to get tau uh, mutant uh, animals, we could interrogate the pathway. It is still rather mysterious how this genetic association in the, the, MAP, the MAP-T is causing or accounting for the pathology in Parkinson's, because in most cases of Parkinson's, we don't see tau pathology, although that's not strictly true, but in large, largely it is. So there is a lot of interesting mystery, mystery still with that association. The middle. Uh, Nick Wood, UCL. So, Martel, I'm interested in... Um, so protective mechanisms, because of course, as you pointed out there in Pink 1 and Parkin, these are pretty much nonsense or knockout mutations for most of the patients. So these guys are surviving 30, 40, 50 years and beyond, with pretty healthily developed normally. Uh, so there must be other mechanisms in cells protecting their nigel neurons and other neurons for quite a long time before the damage accumulates. And have you looked into any of that? Because of course, they may well be druggable targets in other ways as well. Yeah, no. That, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And we are actually starting to, yeah, so in some ways you could argue that targeting pink one through an activator is very challenging. What would be much more tractable would be to find modifiers in which inhibition would be beneficial. So we are actually at the moment doing quite a lot of studies where we're using SR, short interfering RNA uh, technology to knock down genes across, for example, the whole kinase family uh, and, and to see whether that could discover any uh, genes, or including kinases, that could potentially upregulate uh, pink one. But certainly, 
uh, that, that is our, our plausible approach. One thing, though, is that you know, there's been a very impressive progress in, for example, the Huntington's field, where they found modifiers that, that, that can, uh, for example, the DNA damage pathway that affect the Huntington expression. They benefit from the numbers of patients that they've been able to interrogate, whereas, as you will be aware, particularly with pink patients, uh, they are relatively rarer. And so, in some ways, an unbiased genetic experiment would, would, would be you know, the ideal scenario, although maybe not at the moment practical. Yes. One of the striking things that, that I've seen is a demonstration of electrical stimulation. What's happening to, 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 to these cells when, when that goes on? So a lot of work has been done in that. So the, the Substantia nigra has it, it, it actually, those, those neurons are in, are in, in relays of circuits. And it turns out there's been a lot of work done on the circuitry of the basal ganglia. And um, there are other collections of neurons that are communicating with the nigra, which yeah. turn out to be sort of inhibitory. For example, there are neurons in, in an area of the nigra called the subthalamic nucleus. So the experiments were, for example, clinically, you can uh, pass a voltage or a current to right. inhibit those neurons. Right. They turn out to kind of de-repress the nigral neurons. And so, so it turns out you can actually enhance someone's function by inhibiting these neurons. So there is a lot of work being done on sort of these circuits, and they have a lot of feedback loops as well. So, it, right. so they don't stimulate more dopa being produced or anything like that, do they? Uh, they, they, may, they may do in an indirect. They may do in an right. indirect way. Right. So the middle question. Uh, Alistair Cumston. So, Maratel, thank you very much, and, and congratulations on your, your work uh, and your lecture. So I may have missed this, but, but why, both in the monogenic and, and also in the sporadic cases, <clears throat> does everything seem to converge on the deposition of just one particular protein, alpha-synuclein, in the Lewy body? What, 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 how does it all end up with that when you've got many different... Uh, genes, proteins, and so on, implicated in the upstream pathways? So I, I think, and again, I'm speculating here, is that it may be that the, the, different, the different genes could be regulating parallel pathways, a bit similar to, for example, the phrase cancer signaling pathways, but then you have nodes on which they could converge. I would like to speculate that perhaps membrane trafficking and regulation of membrane trafficking by RABs and could be a node in which different disparate genes, which functionally are doing different things in the cells, are actually converging on, which then would have an impact on the ability of alpha-synuclein to remain folded. And, and so that is certainly you know, a hypothesis that, that, that needs to be tested. OK, well, I'd like to join with that sentiment to thank you very much for taking so much trouble to explain this enzymology, biochemistry, cell biology to us in a simple, understandable way and to, us, to explain your science, which is clearly as complicated as the whole nervous system so well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. And I, I now have the pleasure to award you with the uh, scroll and the medal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.